The science is clear. Urgent action is needed to limit the effects of climate change. However, as was noted in the last lecture, little to nothing has happened in terms of international agreement on binding targets and timetables for emissions reductions. Science can tell us what has happened, why it has happened, even what can fix it, but not how we should fix it. Let me explain what I mean by this. The decision of how we should fix it is a decision for society, not science. How we should fix it is a question for public policy. Science can inform public policy, but it cannot define public policy. So what frameworks should govern the public policy towards climate change on the international arena? Given that our main concern is the impact of global warming on human communities, perhaps a good place to start is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This declaration was proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly in Paris on the 10th of December 1948. In the preamble to the declaration, it is written that recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world. The reference to all members of the human family has both spatial and temporal dimensions, which brings peoples of all countries and of all generations within its scope. The reference to equal and inalienable rights affirms the basic equality of all peoples across all generations in the human family. This argues strongly that action must be taken, but what principles should govern action? There are three principles that are frequently put forward as those that should govern international action. The first principle is the precautionary principle that states that a lack of scientific certainty should not prevent appropriate action being taken. This principle was acknowledged in Article 3.3 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It was included because even in 1992 the threats of climate change were seen as dangerous and potentially catastrophic. It was meant to spur international action that a lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. The second principle is that polluters should pay for the damage of their pollution. This is a well-known principle that has been written into environmental legislation for a long time. It recognises that carbon dioxide and many other greenhouse gases are global pollutants. They affect the global commons. And the third principle is that of equity, both intergenerational and international equity. This principle is recognised as just discussed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Intergenerational equity argues that we hold the natural environment of our planet in common with all members of our species, past generations, the present generation and future generations. As members of the present generation, we hold the earth in trust for future generations. At the same time, we are beneficiaries entitled to use and benefit from it. Of the three principles, the most difficult to apply is that of equity. At the moment, in terms of income, the richest half, that is the high and upper middle income countries, are responsible for 86% of global CO2 emissions. The bottom half, that is the low and lower middle income countries, are responsible for only 14%. The UNFCCC recognises this, this inequity by a clause that states that because the industrialised countries have benefited so much from fossil fuel burning, they should take the lead and the first action in combating the problem and reducing emissions. This figure further recognises the inequity. It shows that the countries who contribute least to greenhouse gas emissions will be most impacted by climate change. So what sort of action is necessary? 
One proposal that was put forward by the Global Commons Institute is called Contraction and Convergence. This figure illustrates how it works. It proposes stabilisation of atmospheric CO2 at an agreed level. In this example, the level has been set at 450 ppmb. This is approximately the level that would result in about a 2 degrees Celsius increase in global average temperature over pre-industrial levels. The first part of the proposal is that the world as a whole agrees to follow an envelope curve. This is the contraction part of the proposal. The second part of the proposal is that eventually, from say 2030, CO2 emissions should be allocated to countries so as to share the emissions equally between all humans. Between now and 2030, emissions need to converge to their 2030 allocations. This is the convergence part of the proposal. This proposal recognises international equity as meaning that emissions should be shared on a per capita basis. This may sound completely unrealistic, but there is a third part of the proposal that allows for trading of emissions. Those that have more than they need can sell to those that want to emit more. The effect of trading would be to move money from developed nations to developing nations. That money could be used to help developing nations industrialise in sensible ways and to develop appropriate non-fossil fuel energy systems. There are enormous problems, political, practical and even possibly ethical, in the details of the contraction and convergence proposal, or indeed any other proposal that can be envisaged. But it does well to illustrate some of the essential principles that have to underlie the necessary action and the scale and the enormous challenge it presents to all countries of the world. Thanks for listening.